Hey, Alexa, this week we're going to be talking about the future of food. Okay, just lay it out there. Don't keep people in suspense or anything. Well, that would be good radio. This is just a podcast. And we're going to discuss how new technologies can help us grow more food and waste less. We'll look at biotechnologies like genetic engineering, gene editing, and CRISPR, and how they might help us feed more people worldwide. These are really important topics, but they're pretty tough to unfold. Yeah, but let's do it anyway. Coming to you from our basement studios at UC Davis. This is Unfold, a podcast where we break down complicated problems and discuss solutions. I'm Amy Quinton. And I'm Alexa Renee. We're going to start this podcast, as we did the last one, talking about carrots. Amy, what is it with you and carrots? And we're going to be talking to this woman. Uh, My name is Diane Beckles. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Plant Sciences. Diane studies plant biochemistry, or more specifically... In my lab, we are interested in addressing basic questions about the factors that determine the quality of fruits and vegetables and cereals. And even more specifically... How the quality of of the foods we eat is affected by refrigeration. So Alexa, ready for this? Uh Uh-huh. Diane researches ways to prevent post-harvest chilling injury. That's cool. (laughs) Exactly. You ever put a tomato in a fridge? Yeah. How did it taste when you took it out? Uh, It's kind of bland. That's how the tomato gets injured. Poor tomato. Well, you ruined it. Still edible, but not so tasty. You might throw it away now, creating more food waste while some people go hungry. Well, that's not cool. But wait, we're talking about tomatoes. So why did you bring up carrots? Because Diane's interest in preventing post-harvest chilling injury in a roundabout way started with a carrot. You know, it started when, when my dad gave me some carrot seeds to grow, and I, I thought that was a complete miracle to put these tiny seeds into the ground, and then boom, food. And not just any kind of food, but just this bright orange colored food that, that tasted really good, and I knew was good for me. How could that happen? Was it magic? It had to be magic, right? How could sunlight and dirt create this this thing that had sugar and it tasted good and it was really pretty then I had a lot of questions and not many people could answer my questions and and so I realized over time that that that's what scientists did. So what kind of questions were you asking that people couldn't tell you the answers to? Where did the carrot come from? Um, My father told me something about photosynthesis and nutrients in the soil but it didn't make sense. There were a lot of dots that he could not connect for me but, but that started something in me, this, this desire to try to understand the natural world, and especially plants. I just thought they were absolutely fascinating. Her fascination with plants and fruits and vegetables started in Barbados, where she grew up. And she grew carrots. And Barbados is a small island. Barbados is gloriously 166 square miles. That's tiny really tiny. Just a speck on this earth. And our population density is pretty high. So we had, when I was a child, about 250,000 people on 166 square miles. And I worried tremendously about having enough dirt and enough soil to produce food for, for people on the island which made her think about the even bigger problems, like... How do we feed this, this growing global population, given that uh, resources are limited? Given Diane's worry about feeding everyone, maybe you can guess what she believes to be one of the most important inventions in the last 100 years. That would take me a while, so what is it? <laughs> it's the refrigerator. Why? It allowed us to store meat and, and um, perishable goods for a longer time, um, and this was important to, to food security. But the drawback of the refrigerator? Post-harvest chilling injury. There are some uh, fruit and vegetables that, you know, not only will you spoil the quality by putting them in the fridge, you know, you can actually accelerate the rate at which they deteriorate. And we're not talking about a small portion of, of what we eat. We're talking about, you know, at least 65% of the most uh, consumed um, fruits and vegetables are affected 
when you put them in the fridge. Produce like bananas, avocados, zucchini, pineapples, and tomatoes. So if you put a tomato in the fridge for a while, then pull it out. And instead of eating the bland thing right away, you leave it out, it would get even worse. You'd see dark spots and fungus. It would start to rot. So Diane is trying to figure out a way to prevent that from happening. We are trying to understand the genes that are misregulated when this produce is stored at low temperatures. We believe that if you can understand how these genes are are altered, you know, you can start with developing biotechnological solutions, but, but also storage solutions. Maybe you can find sprays or dips or physical treatments that can help to make the produce a little bit more robust to preserve the, the integrity of these genes that are destroyed by refrigeration. We went to Diane's lab to speak with her PhD student, Karin Albornoz, who is working on the problem. Karin is conducting research on the genes of the tomato. She has in front of her a small Tupperware-looking container of tomatoes. What we did in the lab, um, we actually created transgenic tomatoes that have a gene. I'm putting my gloves on. And these tomatoes have a, a gene from another species. Yes, foreign DNA from another species. It's genetic engineering, or what consumers sometimes call a GMO. If you need a refresher on that, please listen to episode two of Unfold. But in this cold tomato case, Karin has introduced a gene from a wild species of tomatoes that evolved in the Andes to tolerate cold and... And also from um, a weed that doesn't enjoy cold, but is more cold tolerant. So the tomatoes I'm evaluating now were in the cold room at very low temperature for three weeks, and then they were transferred to room temperature for three days. The result was unexpected and, well, not good. These tomatoes don't look very good. They have sort of a yellowish, orangish color, and they have signs of decay. There are fungi growing on the tomatoes right now because they are damaged by the cold treatment. And that is actually an interesting uh, result because we get to try to understand what is happening behind these results and see the real effect of the gene that we introduce into the tomatoes. Finding solutions that would prevent the tomato from rotting and improve handling after it's been picked would help prevent food waste. But Diane says we're obviously not there yet. In terms of coming up with a, a lasting solution that you know, would make a huge shift in industry. I, th- I think that may be at least 10 years away, if, if not beyond. I hope I am wrong. I would love to be wrong. It's even more critical to address these issues as the climate changes and the population is predicted to boom. Which is why Diane isn't just hoping to improve the shelf life and handling of the tomato, but also another more widely eaten vegetable. The potato. Potatoes. Tomatoes, potatoes. (laughs) I feel like there should be a song about them. (laughs) It's my life. Ketchup and chips. Anyhow. (laughs) So what's wrong with potatoes, you may ask? After all, you can store them for a pretty long time. But like the tomato, it's also sensitive to cold, right? So instead, they're stored at higher temperatures than ideal. And that can break down the starch to sugar. So what happens when the starch is broken down to sugars? Well, you lose some of the yield, right? Because the sugars, and this is not the stuff that we value in in chips and fries. But something even more insidious happens, especially if you then throw those potatoes into hot oil. You mean like make French fries? Or chips if you're from Barbados. So when you fry your chips and you see those black spots, or if you, you know, you go to a fast food restaurant or, or you, you, you know, buy frozen chips and you see these black, blackened regions, um, that's probably um, attributable to, you know, acrylamide formation. Acrylamide is not good. It's, it's a carcinogen. Now we could all just avoid fries. But what would be the fun in that? So Diane wants to make these fries crispered. What? Trying to come up with a verb for a process that's hard to explain. Okay, well, that didn't work. She wants to use a gene editing technology called CRISPR. And CRISPR stands for... Clustered, clustered regularly, interspace, short, palindromic, repeats. Clustered, regularly, interspace, short, palindromic, repeats. 
which you really don't need to commit to memory. All you need to know is that this DNA editing tool could revolutionize food. Think of it as a new kind of molecular scissors. You can introduce or eliminate certain traits without requiring foreign DNA or genes from another species, which you do with GMOs. There's a precision there that is absolutely delicious. Delicious, she really said that. You, you hardly have a genetic footprint on the edited crop. And it's so precise and so similar to the original parent that you've modified that the USDA has, you know, said that edited uh, plants do not need to be treated as regulated articles. So they're essentially non-GMO. Diane is using CRISPR technology to change the starch in the potato. We want to alter the, the structure of starch in potatoes. Um, not only so that it's difficult to break down during cold storage, which would help with the acrylamide problem, but also so that it's difficult to break down when we eat it. Making the starch more fibrous and, well, healthier. It sounds like a three-for-one, right? Right. She'd create a healthier potato with a longer shelf life that doesn't produce acrylamide, which is carcinogenic. You know, I have this, this vision that, you know, if you could use gene editing technology to produce... Um, a food product that clearly the consumer can see would have positive benefits for their health and that this product would also help mitigate environmental damage, that, you know, they would gravitate towards such a product. They would see the value of biotechnology. Diane believes CRISPR and gene editing wouldn't just create healthier potatoes or food that won't spoil. It could also create crops that could withstand droughts, floods, and disease. All of which are imperative with climate change and a growing population. But biotechnology isn't an easy sell, as we've seen with the GMO debate. While the USDA doesn't regulate gene editing in plants as it does in GMOs, there are still concerns about using gene editing and CRISPR technology when it comes to breeding animals. Alexa, I'm sure you've heard about our hornless cows that animal geneticist Allison Van Enenem has bred. Yeah, she used gene editing to prevent a cow's offspring from having horns. Right, and this was for animal welfare reasons, to prevent them from hurting each other and their handlers. Right now, farmers burn off a calf's horns. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So I went to our feedlot here on campus to check up on them and to talk to Allison about the future of gene edited animals. Hello, guys. They're very chatty this morning. How are you, boys? Allison is talking to her hornless cows. And, well, they're talking back. What do you think about not having horns? Hey? That's, that might be... Wow. I didn't know they were that vocal. Instead of horns typical of the breed, these guys have hair where horns should be. Allison used gene editing to knock out the gene responsible for horn growth and replace it with a gene of a bull that doesn't produce that trait. Some cattle breeds, like Angus, naturally don't grow horns. So there's about 9 million dairy cows in the U.S., so that's about 9 million calves a year or so that are having their horns um, burned off. And so I know I'm a geneticist, but genetics is a better way to address this problem than, than physically burning them off. So that's kind of the idea. Now Allison is researching any potential effects from the gene edit. So we're being asked, are these animals, you know, normal? And so it's like, well, yeah, they're cows and they don't have horns. And so we're also documenting, like, their health status and their... Um, eventually milk production and whether the meat in the case of the bulls, sorry boys, um, is different to normal. So because it, it's the first offspring of an edited animal, we're um, doing this kind of really thorough evaluation of everything. Luckily for Allison, today is the day the gene edited female offspring gets a pregnancy check. A pregnancy is important in determining whether a gene edit affects milk. Are you going to preg check her? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. We should go do that. Okay. Let's go do that. That's very lucky that we're out here for this. If you've ever seen a cow get a pregnancy check, you know why it would be hard to imagine anyone getting excited by it. But hey, I'm no animal scientist. Veterinarians soon corral the animal into a squeeze chute that steadies her for the pregnancy check. So I'm going to put my probe in right now. I'll demonstrate that. Uh, and, uh... But today the vet had to deliver bad news. 
Okay. So right now, I'm not seeing any evidence of the pregnancy, unfortunately. Allison was fine. hoping the gene-edited oh, animal okay. named Princess okay. and her control in this experiment, a non-gene-edited cow, were both pregnant at the same time in order to test similar milk samples. Allison's other gene editing project is using CRISPR to create bulls that will father only male offspring. Uh, males are about 15% more efficient than females at converting feed into gain, so they basically require less feed to get to market weight. That can make the beef industry more efficient. In fact, gene editing technology holds huge potential in farm animals. It could make pigs, chickens, and cattle resistant to viruses and nasty diseases. But unlike gene editing in plants, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration says it will treat the edited DNA of an animal as if it were a drug. It's really my gene editing as if we're doing drug research, like we're, I don't know, testing pharmaceutical product on them or something, and it's not. It's their, their DNA has been tweaked, and so it's, it's not a, a chemical. The concern, in part, is that gene editing technologies like CRISPR may have so-called off-target effects. Altering the DNA in one part of the genome may have consequences on another part. But Allison says a lot of the controversy stems from the potential use of CRISPR to genetically engineer humans. And that's fine. And so a really simple way to address that would be to say, if you're editing humans, then you're subject to this regulation. But if you're doing cattle breeding or food animal um, alterations where you're not introducing foreign DNA, in other words, you're not making a, a GMO, then you're going to be treated like traditional breeding. She says the FDA rules for animals are a huge regulatory block that will require elaborate and costly safety studies. She believes it could end gene editing research on animals in the U.S. It concerns me that plant breeders will be able to use this technology and animal breeders won't. And at the end of the day, we're both producing food. And in fact, I would argue the demands for things like disease resistance um, and some of the animal welfare traits like not growing horns um, that could be could be addressed using these genetic approaches will basically not be allowed to be used. So Alexa, Allison says gene editing can be used as one of the main drivers of sustainability. If we can use it to produce cows resistant to infection or chickens immune to avian flu, we could keep production pretty high. And reduce the use of antibiotics, which could be healthier for humans too. Right. Making a gene editing product that has positive attributes for humans seems to be an easier sell. So it kind of makes sense that the first gene edited crop, which just hit the U.S. market this year, is a gene edited soybean that is supposed to be healthier for consumers. That's right. I heard about that. It apparently creates an oil with no trans fat and is being served up in some restaurants. But regulations seem to be putting a hold on using the technology in animals, right? Yeah, in Europe, gene-edited animals and plants are being regulated as GMO foods. So it's even tougher to bring either one of those to the marketplace. So I guess we'll have to wait and see how all of this unfolds. Such an appropriate verb, Alexa. Next time on Unfold, we're going to talk about the Internet of Food, whatever that is. We'll explain it. 